All right. Hey, everybody. I'm excited to have Maddox Schuler on today. I am Diane Gibbs, the host of Design Recharge. That's what you're watching live right now. And if you're new, you can uh, chat with us over in this box. You can ask questions if you didn't get any questions to me earlier through an email. But I'm excited to have Maddox. Maddox is a designer turned type um, creator, I guess. And so we're going to talk to Maddox. Max, give us a little bit. Um, thanks for being here, for one. Yeah, and give us a little having bit, me. Give us a little bit of your background. Yeah. Um, my name's Maddox. <laughs> I'm 26. Uh, I grew up in Georgia and uh, grew up doing design as like a side thing, you know. Was in a band, so I figured I needed t-shirts and a website, so I just kind of picked up design from that and took like art classes in school and always doodled in my note sides, you know, side of notes and stuff, but so art, like, or design played a role in my life then, um, but it wasn't like a, a huge forefront forefront of a role, and so then that led me into college where it still played a background role, um, and we can get into the story more so, I guess, uh, during the interview, but that led me into type design as I did design on the side and then did type design on the side and then it came became a full-time thing, so I've been doing Fort Foundry full-time for the past uh, year or so. Uh, it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. All right, so I, all right, so here we go. I always forget to pull myself back up because I'd rather look at your face than mine, I guess. Um, so um, you went to Georgia, so I grew up in Georgia too, so we have that big Georgia, you know, togetherness, yeah. I guess. I mean, I grew up in Atlanta, and I think you grew up outside of Columbus area, right? Yeah, Columbus, yep. Um, and Welcome to your mom, who, you know, my mom also watches the show. I'm not sure if she's here yet, and she never writes anything in the chat. I, she's like, I don't know what to say, and I'm like, just say, hey, Diane. Anyway, but it's good to have your mom here, too, so say hey in the chat, Pam, if that's you. Um, I'm glad to have everybody else who's in the chat, so I'm excited. So you went to Georgia, and you went, um, which um, we have these great things that in the state of Georgia, the Hope Scholarships, which uh, allow for people to go to school um, for free if you make a good enough, if you make all A's, I think, and then if you make B's, you get something, and then it, but it's really, really nice. And I don't know if that influenced your decision on going to Georgia at all. It yeah. wasn't. It was it. I was super into music uh, in high school. Oh. I still love music, still love playing and stuff. And I was thinking about going to Belmont, which is in Nashville, um, which is more of a musically oriented school. And uh, with, like, the, the Hope Scholarship pretty much pays for all your tuition, and then Athens is such a good music town that I was like, man, maybe I could get the bo best of both worlds and save some money um, along the way. So that was, that was, like, I guess one of the biggest things going to Georgia. Uh, so, yeah. Well, and Athens is huge as a music town. Lots of big bands have gotten started there, and it has a, a good, I mean, it's a really cool town. Athens is awesome. Yes. Um, Anybody who comes to visit, Yeah. Come on. We'll, we'll be there show you all the good places. We'll be there soon in a couple weeks, but I'll be, uh, me and Meredith will be cheering for Auburn at that oh, point. Oh, no. We'll, we'll keep football out of the conversation for <laughs> those designers who aren't into it. But, all right, so you you didn't study graphic design. And yeah. I, think, I think it's a funny kind of story. So um, tell, tell us why and tell us what you did study. Yeah, so once I got into college, um, I didn't know what my major was. I started with journalism because I, I, I like writing, but then slowly was like, well, my dad did business, uh, and so may, I was like, maybe I should do business just to be safe job-wise. Like, I don't know what the future, like, I had no clue. I, I always loved design, but I never thought of that as a viable source of income, I guess. Right. Uh, I just never, I don't think I was in the circles or saw people doing it, and so that was one of the things. So it's helpful to be able to see people who are making a living doing this, uh, for sure. And uh, so I just did marketing. I did a religion minor, too, because I, I like that stuff and found it interesting. But, um, yeah, I continued to do it on the side, made T-shirts for my friends when we would do, like, dance parties or dumb parties like that. So it was fun, but uh, it always played a background role, for sure. So you, you did business, was it focused on a certain aspect, because I've always thought, marketing. So um, as a, because I, I 
I don't know. Anyway, my dad didn't want me to just major in art because he thought, I'm going to have to pay for this kid for the rest of her life <laughs> if, I, if I let her be an artist, which I think is kind of maybe where you were thinking you were trying to be practical. Um, and then, you know, at Auburn, I made two Ds at Auburn. You know, it does help if you go to class, uh, but accounting and economics, and I did go to economics and I tried accounting, um, but economics was really boring. Maybe I just had a bad teacher, but you have to go through those classes to get to the other business cool, fun classes. And I didn't do well, so my dad let me just do graphic design. And he was like, good luck. I hope you can make it. And thankfully, I have. But I think that a lot of people don't know what that title of that is. I end up sitting and teaching people what a graphic designer does a lot. But when you finally found out what that person does, um, was that after you'd already finished, or was it in the middle of school, or when? Uh, it was, I would say, after I finished. Like, I took some new media classes at Georgia, which dabbled in some design aspects of Photoshop and Flash back then and all that good stuff. And uh, But I didn't, like, I didn't really understand the term really graphic designer and, until I moved out to Seattle and was working for a church out there and there were three designers on staff and so that like helped me get more of a, a feeling of like oh this is what these guys do I like doing this stuff yeah like so yeah I, it, yeah I didn't know, know what I didn't really understand what it was before that so you got your degree and it was in marketing and I think actually that was a really smart thing because now having your own company now you actually know all this other stuff that goes into it that as designers we're kind of at a loss for because we don't know that stuff so I think it's a good good way that you did that so yeah, I you, think it's definitely come in handy for sure yeah yeah so you go you get a, you get your degree and then you go and you get a job in Seattle with a big mega church and you start doing content creation. You're a co like a content manager, right? Right. So I'm working with authors every day to get them to write posts for our website. Um, and we're publishing daily articles, so editing those when needed. And then also we all love to do graphic design alongside the articles. And so that's when it started picking up more of like I was doing daily articles designed for them. And they were super typographic-based uh, designs, um, just to keep it more easy. I, I wish I could illustrate like crazy. That would be awesome. But um, the route that we took was more typogra typographic based. And so uh, that just had me searching out and scouring the web for different typefaces and styles and all that good stuff. And also was on a budget. So <laughs> trying to find good typefaces like that is hard. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And that was where I feel like doing that day in and day out helped me develop um, the chops that for typography and just looking for that stuff. Well, and I think as you as the creating kind of a plan for the content has probably also really helped you as a, um, a business owner because now you're thinking about marketing your fonts and how you need to get them more visible and keep them viable and keep keep that stuff out there, it is something that having that kind of social media content creation I think has probably really helped you more so than, or I would think it has just because you've had to have that in the back of your mind with this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and one of the things that's hard about typefaces is one, choosing a good name for it, and then two, like writing good uh, copy for the typeface like that's just one of the hardest steps for me to come up with good content for that and so I think that that definitely has helped just like with the content creation and working with words all the time like that like I want to I, I don't want it to be just a run of the mill description I like I love Heffler stuff and if you read their descriptions you learn a lot about typography and about typefaces and all the ins and outs and where this originated from and the time period and stuff like that and so I love that about that and I love when designers like Kyle Wayne Benson he'll do a uh, post about like the development of a font um, and, and write a blog post into that and I just love those behind the scenes things. They might be for a niche people but uh, I, I just really like that stuff. Well we're the niche people here so we're into that <laughs> stuff too so you're yeah. talking to your people. But I think that having, is that part of what you started hunting for fonts and then you were reading about these things that got you interested? Um, or was it just looking at them and you were the challenge of having to come up with something new? Uh, for sure. I think it was looking for fonts and 
Uh, this was a few years ago, and it was when, like, Lost Type was just coming out with all their typefaces and stuff, and that was just, like, blowing my mind. And I think that seeing graphic designers entering into the type design world, that kind of showed me, oh, people can do this. Like, people are doing this, and they're making some really cool stuff. And uh, that is what got me interested and kind of gave me the, the drive to be like, what if you did one of these? Like, just, just to try it out, like, maybe just one, like, just see if you like it or not. And so uh, that was where, like, it all started, I guess, the gateway drug <laughs> into type design <laughs> for me. <laughs> well, I, um, that's a good way to put it. I actually, um, it's so funny. I've never done any drugs, Maddox, so it, um, I, I think I was scared as a child. Um, it was the the brain and the egg and the frying pan kind of thing, and um, I was I think I was always, you know, my sister was really smart, so I was like, I don't have any brain cells to lose, but I'm exactly the same way about, uh, I have never does a typeface, and I talked to you about this when we were talking the other day, it's really scary to me, almost like drugs is scary to me, <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll make a crazy analogy, I guess, but it is so, it, it's intimidating to me, because there's so much that goes into it, yep. and I know so much about type that or maybe not so much, but I know about type and I teach about type that I think, oh my gosh, I would never be able to do this. So to me, I think it's really great that you took this on and you were like, I'm just going to try it. And then you fell in love. Yeah, yeah. It was, like you're saying, like I started off super small. It was just, you know, hey, I'm going to make the uppercase and lowercase and that's it. Like maybe some numbers and symbols here and there. But professional typefaces have all the accents, symbols, all different kinds of glyphs. I think it comes out to around 220, like, minimum. But they can get up into the thousands with all the ligatures and all that good stuff. But 220 minimum is a lot of work to make sure each one of those characters is working together. So I started with just free fonts. You know, I'm going to make one. It doesn't need to be professional. Like, it's just going to have the bare minimum <laughs> for me was, like, you know, 26 letters, only uppercase with numbers and symbols, and that was, like, a good starting point. And yes, my mom is writing over here that I better not be doing drugs, which is funny. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't do drugs either, Maddox. Yeah. <laughs> and so is your mom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's go back to the church real quick. Oops, sorry. Um, what was the biggest challenge working at that church? Um, okay, was it tight budget? Was it time? Was it just the fact that you had to kind of have a lot of irons in the fire? Yeah, I think that we were publishing like one to two articles daily, and so getting really good quality content is hard when you're putting it out that fast on with such a small team. And so uh, I think over that time it was really good for me to develop a skill of like what makes writing good, like what gets people interested in reading this. And so um, that, that was like a pretty challenging part. And really, like I, I did marketing, but I didn't do... Uh, a ton of creative writing or things like that. I enjoyed it, but, but uh, oh, that was one of the biggest things was just developing an eye out for what, what sets this article apart from all the other clutter that's on the internet that people are putting out. And so that, that was, yeah. Were you able to see and track kind of what, which ones, which type uh, headers that you designed that were getting more traffic? What do you think that that played any role on which articles were seen longer That's or a good more? Question. If we weren't able to track it, you know, it was a little harder. We were able to say these articles did better than these articles, but I do remember to like we would be at conferences or have a booth at conferences and people coming up and being like, oh, I loved how this banner on this article really accented, you know, the theme of the article and that was like one of the most uh, rewarding things to hear I think in the job because I just loved that part of it and so, yeah. So how long did each one take you? Because I know in the beginning it probably took you longer, but as you're having to do it twice a day every day, it you have to get faster. Yeah, it was. I think figuring out a good concept like for the article and not spending time on a concept that wasn't great, like like that took me a while to get. Of like, this isn't worth my time, you know. Um, and then figuring out uh, how to how to execute those things because I, I wasn't formally trained. And so I would see something online or a style of design that I liked and trying to figure that out. So that took a long time to develop. So it might have been like uh, an hour to two hours per graphic at first um, because 
we had other things going on of working with authors and all these other pieces of content that we needed to do. And then uh, I think it moved into more of like the the 30 minute to an hour range on each one. That's pretty good. So, all right, so the budget was a challenge, but maybe time and just the learning curve at the beginning yeah. was kind of where it was. So you force, by forcing yourself to create two things, if not more than that, a day, um, do you think it was more frustrating or more uh, beneficial? I mean, I loved it at the time. Like, I was, it wasn't too frustrating. I think I was just, like, so excited that design was part of my job. Um, just, like, a little, I don't know, yeah. And so then I think that it, it, as I grew in it, I felt more confident in it. So it was still a lot of fun, but uh, I forgot the, the what I was going to say there. But, yes, I enjoyed it a lot, but it wasn't too frustrating, yeah. Okay, so... You you created a typeface, and did you use that typeface to solve some of your problem or some of your um, design problems at work? And what typeface was it, and why did you create it the way you created it? Yes, uh, I think I just I created that one just for fun. It was called Proto, which is a play on prototype because <laughs> I like bad puns, but. Um, uh, and it was very like square based. I can actually post the link in the comments. Let me get it real fast on Dribble. Um, it's still available for free as a reminder to my terrible <laughs> intro to type design. Um, here it is. But yeah, it just started off with me snapping things to Illustrator, snap to the grid, and just doing like, okay, I'm going to make a square typeface and just let's see how this goes and just using a simple stroke in Illustrator and it wasn't really, I think I might have used it on maybe one or two articles but it wasn't super versatile it's, looking back on it, like, I, don't, I don't think I would use it today at all but during that time I'm like this is great, I'm loving this right now and that, like even those old articles I remember what I was going to say, they were really fun to make but now looking back on them I'm like gosh what was I doing, you know, this is, this is terrible <laughs> um, but yeah Talk yourself um, oh man, the book's way over there. I got that book that um, you talked about in one of your things. Anyway, Design designing type. type. Yeah. So, did you learn about anatomy just from reading and looking? Because I'm trying to think how, if we wanted to encourage somebody who's not as afraid as me as I am. I'm not afraid of a lot of things. I've jumped out of a plane five times, but I'm afraid to design a typeface. Yeah. So, um, what you know? What were you digging into that you were like, "Hey, I gotta get a little bit more clarification," um, or learning? So, luckily in Seattle, there there's Microsoft out there. There's a, another type designer out there called, named Laura Worthington, and um, there's some typographers out there, and they have daily meet, uh, not daily, but monthly meetups uh, where they would go to a bar, a pub, and grab some beers and drink and talk about type. And I love those times. And so what I would do is I would bring my specimen images and things that I was working on to those things. <laughs> and they would come in and critique them and give some helpful thoughts. And, and they were, were like, hey, you should check out this book. It's kind of like the typographic or type design bible, I should say, that designing type that it goes into each letter. And so they really helped hone me in and like... Uh, just took time. Like it was only two hours a month, but I was like the time that I look forward to most each month because I was like I get to bring my stuff and they're gonna give me some good thoughts on it. And so it was it was really helpful to have those people. I'm gonna I'm gonna find a link to it and um, by Karen Chang, and it is it's a really good book. Um, I wish I had not put it all the way on the other side of the room, but there it's in the chat now. If anybody wants to check it out. Um, there's a question, and we're going to cover it a little later, but we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and ask it because I like to ask questions as, the, as we get them in the chat. So what are your thoughts about releasing freebies to create a buzz? Because I think Proto was a, a freebie, right? Right. You created a few in the beginning that were just really for free. Yep. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that... Uh... Freebies are great. Like I think that they serve people. Like designers, most of the time, it's it's way easier to just download something for free and use it instead of figuring out what's the license on this. Is it free for personal use and not commercial use or things like that? 
And so I think freebies, even, you know, you see source sans and some other t open source typefaces, clear sans um, that are coming out that are free to use, all of, you know, Google fonts, open sans, all that good stuff. Like, I think that's awesome. Uh, as a personal designer, like what um, we're talking about here to create buzz, I think that I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now if I hadn't have done Moonshiner. And so Moonshiner was my third one that I came out with that I gave away for free. And that, like, got, I, put, I put it on Dribbble, which is, you know, design community that shares stuff. And it was able to gain traction there and I think help uh, get introduce myself to people or be like, oh, this guy's making stuff. And I think that people want to know people who are making stuff. And so that was really cool um, to see the response to that. And that was when I was like, okay, maybe I'll take this one and turn it into something professional and, and charge money for it because it's going to cost a lot of extra work for me and my time. Because Moonshiner, I was just like, I'm going to take a weekend and just work all weekend and hammer this thing out. <laughs> I think it shows in the typeface, but it was just like, I want to just finish this in a weekend, which is never a good idea when you're making a typeface, <laughs> but uh, it was a great start for me, and I think that freebies uh, can, can really, really be helpful, whatever you're doing, whether it's type or designing uh, websites or icons or things like that. Anything that you can give away for free to help people is awesome. I, I agree. I think it's always a good idea. Obviously, that's why I did this show for free. Um, anyway, so you... We're able to work with, with adult, um, through the meetups um, with Laura Worthington, with other just designers that were giving you feedback. And you were also getting feedback, good feedback from the people at the church too. How many designers were, how many designer designers were at the church not doing content creation? Three. Three designers doing like the branding for sermons to creating, you know, paint pamphlets for it's raising money to plant or get a new building to anything design related those those guys were handling those sort of things so then after so they would help you right um, they would look at stuff as well yeah yeah so it kind of started I got on their radar because I was doing bad work which is great because um, I was <laughs> like I started off you know just like at the local church making um, some slides to help out and they and they didn't have time to do it there, and so I started making some, and then it was total brand heresy, <laughs> like, you know, outside of brand guidelines, what I was doing, and they were like, what are you doing? <laughs> and so, but they were really helpful, and they were like, we'll help you hone that in, and uh, from time to time, I would bring over designs, and they would help critique them and be like, here's what you want to look out here, your mar like, your type is way too close to the edge of the margins, and certain things like that that are just... I didn't see them. I don't know. I just didn't have an eye for them or whatever, but they were really helpful in, in helping me do that. So, yeah. Well, and I think that's where uh, the design education helps because we bring up these, because uh, those are like normal intro to graphic design kind of things. It's, uh, you know, I get up, kids will put type right here and then the image right here, and I get up right in their face and I'm like, is this uncomfortable? Yeah. And they're like, yes, I don't want you this close. And they back away, and I'm like, don't back away. That's how close your type is. So, but it's something that we don't think about as just a user necessarily because we think, oh, well, it looks pretty good. Yeah. So I think it's good that you had that kind of safe place to kind of learn and get critique because I think that sometimes designers who are just on their own um, have that, they don't have that part. And the, the critiquing part can be um, a bit painful for some people. They're not, um, who aren't seeking it out and then they feel like um, it, it can be, kind of harsh so I'm glad you had a couple different sources to get some good kind of feedback yeah yeah it was great alright so um, Noah has a question he wants to know which Ninja Turtle do you identify with the most easy Michelangelo of course I don't know if it was just because his name started with M and my name starts with M probably as a little kid that made enough like of a connection for me of like this is my guy I loved the nunchucks and I also had a game, Turtles in Time, for the SNES, which I would always play as him. And so that he was my guy. Okay, good good to know. Great question, Noah. <laughs> yeah, keeping it real and getting some dirt that we don't have on, on you probably out there. Now it's, now it's out there. All right, so any early entrepreneurial um, experiences that really made a difference for you? Because as an entrepreneur, it can be a difficult thing sometimes, but if you've always kind of been entrepreneurial, have you? 
I don't think so. Like, I have friends who are, and I'm like, you're definitely entrepreneurial. <laughs> um, but for me, it was just, uh, I think that I kind of just stumbled into it, um, and I, I feel super lucky and blessed to be able to do it because I was doing it just as a fun thing on the side that then, like, it was just a hobby. I didn't get into this to be like, I want to start a type foundry and do this full time. It was just like, I like designing, and I like designing type too, so I might make a typeface and just see what happens. Um, and so that it was really cool to see it the momentum pick up and be able to sorry y'all about to hear a train I'm outside my no, house no your <laughs> mom okay <laughs> he says you must have had a wonderful, wonderful child <laughs> yes of um, course <laughs> there's also a train coming by that's about to be really loud so get ready guys but okay. um <laughs> yes so what was I saying all right so you you started this as a hobby and is, yeah. You had a foundry called Hold Fast Foundry. Correct. And then you changed to Fort Foundry. Can you kind of tell us why? Yeah, yeah. Um, Hold Fast, that was just like a theme, a term that I really liked a lot. Kind of hold, like my original typefaces were more of a vintage, you know, inspired old square, blocky serifs, um, flare serifs going on back then. Um, and so I, I guess that theme was in my mind as I was doing those older models. And uh, I don't know, a, a year in, it just didn't. Yeah, <laughs> um, a year in, it just didn't feel like it fit. Like, yeah, that theme was still good and all, but I just felt like I wanted it to be something more. And it, I wanted to change from going from just type to doing more goods and things like that that could be a part of people's lives. <laughs> yeah, this train. <laughs> um, and so I wanted it to, to actually have a physical presence instead of just a digital presence on someone's computer. And with all that, I just really like the idea of fort and, and as a kid building forts and just like that whole theme of like never stop creating or building. And so I, I, I just wanted, I, I felt like it was, it fit more with where I was headed, I guess. And so that was, made the whole change from a new brand. <laughs> That one it was loud. Train. <laughs> we we get to you know listen to this at night when it passes our house and all that good stuff and then, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, RIP headphones <laughs> users. That's right, Jason Karn. <laughs> so <laughs> so you that's kind of big though to change. Um, had you gone out solely on your own um, when you were doing Hold Fast? Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, the timeline was May, May of 20, March or May of 2013, I released the first typeface professionally under Holdfast Foundry. Uh, released Gen, that was Bourbon first, and Abolition was the Sans Serif version of that, and then Gen, uh, and then from there, that was like, I started realizing that, oh, this is bringing in more money than my day job, maybe I should start thinking about doing that, and at that time, we... My wife and I uh, were pregnant, and so we were like, we should move back uh, to be close to family. It's just such a far away away being in Seattle. We love that town. Like, it was so good, but we knew we wanted to be close to family when we started having kids. And uh, so from there, uh, we, in November was when I went full-time just to doing Hold Fast, and I just released, like, industry around that time and then released Industry Inc. at the beginning of that year, and then was like, I feel like I want to change it up. And so I just started Fort in June. Um, so it's just been five or so months uh, from doing Fort. But it's all been, it's, it's the same thing. It was just a name and brand change, if that. That right. was hard, though, because it was like changing all the sites, and you're losing a lot of, like, uh, recognition and search, you know, people are searching for hold fast when it's not coming up and things like that. So it was, it was definitely something to deal with. But I felt like considering all the cons with that, it was, it was well worth it. Better to start it in the beginning right, than right to wait yeah. a while. Yeah. But it, it can be a challenge to try to make that thing when you when you have had such a good following with hold fast. So I'm, it that's. A pretty ballsy move, and I'm glad you did it because now you have something that you feel like you can will take you further longer. Yeah. Um, but it is. It's. Can you talk a little bit about some things that you did strategically to maybe get some of those people back over? Um, and I love industry. I think I 
own all your typefaces because industry is just awesome. And we'll talk about that in a minute because it's about building. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I think that one of the big things was just uh, changing the site to the Hold Fast site was just like, hey, we're no longer Hold Fast Foundry. We're now Fort Foundry. And I wanted it to have like to feel like a big release, not just to feel like, oh, I, you know, on a whim I decided to change our name. But I, <laughs> I spent a while developing out the brand, the colors, getting them just the way I wanted, and developing the site. And uh, so I rebuilt that on Shopify moving from WooCommerce, which is where Holdfast was, to Shopify. And uh, I had done some code in the past, so I was comfortable enough to, to do it there and rebuilt our, uh, the Fort site. And I just wanted to feel like this big launch. Um, and with that, I launched you know a few goods like T-shirts and little booklets, sketch booklets, and a poster or whatnot. So hopefully that made it feel big or just like this is something that I took seriously and not just doing on a whim. And then... Uh, just trying to get the word out through Twitter and things like that. And I wanted to release Factoria at that time, um, but there were certain changes that I started making that I really liked, and I was like, this is going to take way longer to get done. Than... So it would have been great to release a typeface around that, but I wasn't able to. And then with Factoria's release, I did a, a, you know, a limited edition specimen poster, which is something I'd never done for Holdfast. So just to make it feel uh, I guess something more is going on here. That's cool. Those are good good things that if somebody was going to rebrand, I think those are always some things that help you to get your name out there because if sometimes if people aren't buying fonts every week, um, then they might have missed something. Yeah, for know? sure. So, so I always think it's a it's a good idea to you know have kind of the long term goal on some of those platforms so that people can always go back and see oh now he's something else oh I got it okay we'll we'll go there. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about industry, um, and we talked a little bit about this the other day, but for me, uh, you know, as a kid, I built Legos, and I when you did Fort, I think in one of the things, the write-ups, it talks about, like, uh, Lincoln Logs, um, and industry such a built, uh, it's a really something that I can kind of take, and I can build, and I can use lots of the parts, or I can use a few of the parts, or I can just use one or two of the parts. Is that something that was intentional? Is that something you've always loved? Do you like working in 3D? Yeah, I mean, I think the industry came, Industry Inc. Uh, came out of me being a designer and knowing, like, these are certain styles that I like with typefaces or things that I like to apply it with. So I think it came in with more of a graphic designer's mindset of, like, how can I build a toolbox for someone who can, so they can have all these options to build and kind of feel like they can make their own combo of whatever so that it can be more original that, that way too and uh, so that was that was kind of the mindset that I had going into that and just figuring out what, what do I want to do and it started off with just like an inline style and maybe the stencil but then once I started doing the shadow styles and all that I was like it just kept becoming more and more and more and I was like oh my gosh what I've, I feel like that's every typeface though you want to do like an extended and a condensed and then it just becomes this huge undertaking that you should have never done in the first place because it's going to take years to finish. I feel that right now. <laughs> it's, that's a massive typeface though. I mean Industry Inc. has a lot of parts and it really is the analogy I gave you the other day was it's like the logo box, the Lego box, not the logo box. That would be nice if there was a logo box. But the Lego box had these, you know, you can make this, I'm really dating myself because ours was a round canister. But, you know, you can design this, you can make this, or you can just make your own stuff. And for me, that's what industry, that typeface is like. So it's really useful, and it can be used in a lot of different ways. And I, uh, Jason said he just used it for an invite. I just used Thanks. it for a, a white paper, somebody in Arkansas. So I love that typeface. Thank you. So how much... Uh, you talk about you know this love for the old, and I think that's really where the hold fast was. And you used to be drug to uh, antique places because your mom and dad liked <laughs> to go antiquing, and you hated it as a kid. Um, how when did you make the change where you started liking it, and how much did that maybe influence your um, creation of new faces or the love for some of that old typography? Uh, I would say it was probably within the past year, which seems so terrible, but uh, I just remember coming back to Athens 
and uh, I think my mom was looking for chairs or something because we had just moved from a studio apartment to uh, a house with three bedrooms, so we were trying to figure out, we need, we need stuff, you know, for, to fill this house, and we went to an antique store, and I, like, started looking around and was just like, oh, my gosh, there is so much good type here. This is crazy. Um, I mean, like, when I was making gin and all those, I was looking online, but never in a physically present place. And so there was just, like, a gold mine there. And I was like, this is the best thing ever. And, it like, they now they're going to have to drag me out of the stores because they're, like, done looking. And I'm, like, trying to take pictures and get all this type stuff. So it's it's that was like a big change for me I think just realizing that and then seeing all the awesome craze that's going on now I think that's really amazing with badge hunting and uh, type hunting and all that good stuff that's going on that you know you find all this old stuff and you can revive it or do certain things and so yeah yeah so a little plug for Keith Tatum and Alan Peters there with their yeah. badge hunting and type hunting and um, it's funny though I'm sure your mom maybe didn't know that you were looking at type stuff you weren't looking for chairs like she wanted you to um, you had focused on something else, but I've also found really good, and I know Jason Carnes done this as well. Found really neat old type books and type specimen books at um, some of these uh, antique places, and you can get these books that are really nice. Some have vellum inlays and really cool stuff if you just dig around. It and can get past the smell sometimes. Yeah, and I love what Jason's doing. That is like lettering library. His stuff is really cool. So. Another plug for that, but you know, taking pictures and, and doing it with those books, that's awesome. Me too. I get my lettering library every month, and it is a really nice um, visual. It would be nice to touch it, but he does a good job on doing that. A little plug for their letteringlibrary.com. All right, so um, how have you used your knowledge of timing releases? I know uh, Factoria wasn't timed exactly uh, at the launch of uh, Fort, but how, how do you... And I think that kind of goes back into that content management kind of mindset, the marketing mindset. How do you think you've been able to use that to your advantage? Yeah, so with the release, uh, it kind of has the most potential um, those first few days that it's out to get on to get on people's radars because they might be looking at, you know, my fonts, like what's new, and you go to to that page. It can be a really long list of typefaces. So when you release one, it's, it might be up at the top, you know, for a few days, and then it's going to move down, down, down. And if if people are able to purchase those, then they're going to be that's going to move it onto the hot new fonts list, which has a much longer life. It has a 50-day life. Um, and so you think about when people are on the internet or thinking about ty buying typefaces. Uh, most and it's uh, there's two different types of buys I think one's like the impulse buy where people are just like hey this is a really good deal I'm buying this right now right. And the other one is more of a consideration of like yes this is gonna cost some money and I think I should I should definitely invest in this um, and it might take a few days or so to, to make that purchase but I think you kinda have the most potential at the beginning of the week same with Saturday and Sunday releases on those days are going to be slow pickings because people are you know doing other stuff on those days and want to go out and go grab drinks or go out to the park or things like that and not be on a computer because they've probably been on a computer all week um, and so I would hope that Monday you know you're you're getting back into your swing of things so you're going to be working a lot that whole day and then Tuesday that might be more of a lull where you go check out oh what's what's new and things so I really like Tuesday releases um, and try to do that, but it's it's really hard because you're submitting a typeface to uh, a foundry or a um, I guess a typeface selling site, um, and they're having to review it and get it on their servers, so that can take some turnaround. So I try to get it to them by like Friday, and then it has like a one or two day turnaround um, on that. But yeah. All right, that's good. Good to know. So um, when you're creating those, like on my fonts. Um, we're just shamelessly plugging people all the time. So um, I, they always have like images that are showing the what you know how to use the font or the font in use. How much do you think that plays a, a part in you selling the font? Yeah. So specimen images, I think, are one of the biggest selling points of a typeface because you're trying to show a designer all the ways that you. You can't show them all the ways, but you can show them a few of the ways that you intend for this typeface to be used. You know, and it's just like giving them more of a solid picture instead of them having to click a typeface and see the waterfall. Like I do that now because I think that I can see better 
like how a typeface feels in that waterfall mode where you're seeing all the letters written out. I do love the specimen still, still because they add some flavor and style, but um, I think that sometimes people oversell their fonts or typefaces with those specimen images. They make really cool specimens and you think you're getting one thing and then you download the font and it turns out to be not as great or not as good as you hoped because the specimens were overly, they oversold the typeface. Um, and so I think they're, they're both helpful, but they can also, you got to be wary of that. So I think it's a both and. Uh, use specimens that are really cool, but also make sure that you're checking the waterfall and doing that sort of stuff um, of, of typefaces to see, is the spacing good? Is the kerning good? Are all these other technical pieces of it good? So um, I thought, in fact, I, I say it wrong probably. Factoria? Fact, Factoria. How do you say it? Yeah, Factoria. Okay, like Victoria, but Factoria. Okay, so um, Factoria you use, uh, so I grew up a Georgia fan, so my blood red, uh, bled red and black for many, many years, and now I just cheer for the offense um, when they play <laughs> Auburn, but so the, whoever's playing offense, usually I cheer for Auburn, but Anyway, another thing. You live so in such a you have Gosh. you have that dogs um, Florida, and I thought I was like, oh man. So, you know, Georgia's um, red and black, and Florida's uh, orange and blue, uh, different orange than Auburn orange, or a different blue, I guess. Um, so what? Why were? Because Factoria is really more like green and cream. I think are the colors that you you chose to kind of. Does that play any um, into any of that, like marketing stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, color color theory is a whole thing of like, what do people feel when they see these colors and things like that. But I I really love to create a feel or a brand around each one of my releases and. That, that's just my take on it and it's the coolest thing is seeing like where designers take a typeface and places to I'd never expect you know but for me it's you know figuring out what what kind of pitch do I want to make with this and for Factoria I think I mean that's a that's a place in Bellevue Washington um, back out in Seattle around there and I think I just seeing that like I just really like that name for some reason that was hard to come up with um, and I don't know where it came like how I arrived at that but um, once I did I was like yeah that feels right that fits um, because it still has that industrial vibe, uh, like the factory, but um, it's it's a bit different. And so, Washington Seahawks out there, I just went with more of that green and navy, right. um, like kind of feel, just that cool cool vibe. And then, since it's such, it could be used for sports. I hope that you know ESPN, Sports Center, things like that, pick it up, please. <laughs> um, since it could be used for that, I was like, man, I saw a really cool old ticket. Um, vintage ticket to a game. I think it was a Georgia game. And then I was like, maybe I'll like kind of use that as some inspiration to make one for an upcoming Georgia game for the Dogs versus Florida. But unfortunately, that did not help them at all. <laughs> I think it was because they let them wear their colors. That's what I think. I think they yeah. shouldn't have let them wear their colored. It was their time to be in the white jerseys. Oops. Yeah, gosh. <laughs> anyway, we'll move on from that. Yeah, source subject. <laughs> but I think a lot of people who are releasing types don't really control the color. They, um, you know, sometimes it'll be really colorful, and I think that's one of the things that's really good about your faces and on how you're advertising them that you're really helping people to focus on the design of the type instead of like being, oh, look at all these cool colors and these awesome flourishes and all these things. It's like I get. I'm just, and I think a limited palette can really sell something even better because as designers we know that all our clients don't have a unlimited budget so having a limited color palette can help um, budget wise but it also helps me to be able to focus on on your content which I think is nice yeah thank you yeah I try to merge those worlds of keeping it simple and so it just shows the type off and I'm not trying to embellish it at you know I'm just showing it is for what it is but also keeping it interesting and thanks, Jason, for posting the link to... Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, awesome. All right, so um, is there anything you would tell me as somebody who's been intimidated to <laughs> try creating a typeface? Um, anything that you would tell me that I could maybe start to gain some confidence in this so that it... What advice would you give somebody like me? Yeah, I would say... Uh, it's don't make it don't let it become this mountain that you feel like you'll never conquer that just start small and say hey I'm gonna make 
a typeface that's only uppercase, and that's it. You know, like just b give yourself a goal that you feel like is attainable and that you won't, you know, feel run down halfway through it. And I think, like, it's just so cool. One of my friends at the uh, co-working place that I work at just downloaded glyphs, and just that whole feeling of, like, I'm able to type out letters that I made, like, it's just a crazy feeling. It's awesome, and you're like, I can't believe that this works like this. I, <laughs> it seems so simple, but it's just, like, this feeling that you're like, I, I can't believe I get to do this. And so I think that you, hopefully you'll get wrapped up in that sort of vibe of, like, oh, man, this is so much fun seeing it all come together and, and working with these letters. And I think there are programs now. I recommend Glyphs. Um, another big one out there is RoboFont. Both of those are great. Glyphs has a mini version. Um, type design can be, and they have a trial version, so it's only a 30-month trial, but type design can be this daunting thing, too, where you get into it and you're like, mm, this isn't really my vibe. Like, these, like, long-term commitments to a design thing, or, I'm not so much for that. So, instead of paying, like, 300 or $500, which is what these programs cost, uh, you could download the trial or do, like, Glyphs Mini to make sure you actually like it. And Glyphs Mini is, like, 50 bucks, and it's just a mini version of the main version of Glyphs. Uh, which I, that was what I did Moonshiner with, was with Glyphs Mini. Um, so that, I, I would say, in those programs, they're, they're getting more and more advanced, and I think that transitioning from Illustrator or programs that you're familiar with, it's, it's a lot easier than you might think. Um, it's, there's a few hurdles to overcome, but you'll get the use of it pretty quick. Um, it has, you know, pen tools, cut tools, things like that, except you're not working with any colors. It's just simple vector shapes. And I actually prefer doing logo work in glyphs now just because of the control that I feel like I have over Bezier's and all that good stuff. And so there's just so much precision um, to it. And so that's, that's a great place to start. Glyphs, their site, like, um, thank you for posting it, has a, a bunch of great tutorials to get people started just to, to get an understanding of how does this program work. Um, and I could give you a quick show it to y'all real quick if y'all want. Yeah. Let me ask you a question while you're getting that up. So yeah. Do you, when you're starting a typeface, do you have a specific use for that face in mind? Um, I think yes. Like the one I'm working on right now is called Colt. We'll see if it changes, but uh, this one is crazy extended. Uh, I can show y'all a quick snapshot of that. Um, this should hopefully be done soon. Oh, cool. But this is what it's looking like. I mean, it still has a lot of ways to go. You use Hamburger a lot, so can you tell us why? Yeah, so Hamburger font sieve, that just is like a term that includes a lot of the letters that are control characters in a, in a typeface, so you can see and get a feel for how is it actually flowing and vibing. So that's why that Hamburger font sieve, I usually just type hamburgers because I like that um, better. <laughs> but uh, so within glyphs, you open it up, I opened up Factoria here, and we're presented with all the different characters of a typeface, you have the accents, um, and luckily you don't have to do each one of these things, this is called a component glyph, where it's pulling in my regular E and pulling in the accent that I've set up for uh, the acute, and it, it, so you don't have to do every single letter, so there's some ways to make the design faster, um, but each of these, you know, is different characters in the typeface. You have your, you know, lowercase, and it goes to numbers and all that good stuff. But the way that it works is in your character, you have your different vectors, um, shapes. And so these are, this is like five different shapes here, if I can count correctly. <laughs> um, and what you're doing is you're setting up these shapes. This is just the A. If you want to preview it, you just hold down spacebar. But you're going in and you can, it's very much similar to Illustrator with, you know, vector points and where's one uh, with curves that I'll bring up. The B here, you know, these green points are curves that are going to keep that curve intact wherever it's, you know, moving like that. Uh, but you go into each of these letters, you can design it out, you're trying to figure out how it's working with the other letters, the width of it and all that good stuff. And then you're going to want to space out the whole typeface and it, a bad space typeface, like, even if the letters look amazing, a badly spaced typeface can do, it, it can be terrible. Whereas you could have a poorly drawn typeface and the spacing could be amazing and it can actually look okay. Like you could, uh, just more legible I guess. But um, you're going in and you're seeing like, hey my I is 40, 
my the other side of the I is 40, my B is 36, and so forth. And so you can go in and you're trying to figure out the spacing of those. So you know the A has a lot of negative space on the left and on the right. So it's gonna, it's going to need less space down here away from the character um, versus the H, which has less negative space on the left and the right side. Is that is that making sense? Is that about so it? you're after you've created all those, then you go in and start dealing with kerning on individual letters. Do you only attack certain letters, and then other letters are just handled like how you handled a C is handled the same way you handle a a G or something, or is it you have to do it for each letter, each combination? That's a great question. So you definitely want to like nail your spacing down completely. Like it's gonna look pretty good. If it's not kerned, you know, like it still looks pretty good. Um, but once you nail that down, then you'll want to go into kerning. And even in spacing, you can set up these things. So notice on the B, this is called a left side bearing over here, the left side of the B, the spacing on it. I've actually input the letter H there. And what that's doing, that's pulling whatever I've set at H to this left side of the B because they're the same shape. Oh, cool. And the right side of it, I'm setting it as different because no other character has that. Now, with kerning groups, I've set the left side of the kerning group to be H. So whatever I kern with H, whether it be H O to H uh, V, I don't I don't know if that would need kerning or not, but uh, those would all be the same for that left side of the B and the left side of the H, and then the right side of the B is in its own kerning group B because it's it's on its own. So you don't have to kern. If, if you have similar character, the sides of them are similar, you don't have to kern every single thing, which is nice. That is nice. It kind of blows me away that you learned all this on your own. Um, it's amazing. I'm really proud of you. Not that I have any reason to be proud of you, but you should be proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what about, what letter do you start with? Um, I with like the H... The I, the E, <laughs> those are just like really le easy letters for me um, I, I, because they're really easy letters. They're pretty straightforward. Uh, but um, a cool video by Heffler and Fred Jones talks about how they start with the H and the O, and then they take you know the right side of the O and the left side of the H. They're very similar to the D, and you can able you're able to piece those together to make the H O D and, and so forth. And so I think that th those are all capital letters we're talking about here. Those are, those are helpful for me um, to start with, just to get a feel of like what is this typeface like? How wide is it actually going to be? Because those are kind of controlling. Because I'm I'm relating everything back to my H and everything back to my O. Is my H is my straighter character and my O is my round character? So my C's, how wide are they in relation to my O? And my D's, how wide are they in relation to my H and so forth? And so um, those are helpful to set up first and get the vibe of like, okay, I want this to be this width or this condensed, et cetera, and go from there. All right, so that's those are great, and maybe I'll get the little mini version and see what I can do. But I think I might need to um, play a little bit more. What about X heights? Does that... Um, come into factor? Do you because I always think of like a big X sites a really friendly font and a little X sites kind of like a little bit more um, shy of a font, I guess. Yeah, so X sites um, there's something you want to look for when laying out copy, whether it be body copy, you want to look for like an X height that's around like sixty to seventy percent of the cap height is a, is a safe number to go around. It's not too high because if it's too high, you're gonna confuse the lowercase letters with the uppercase. So if it's too high, that might be more of a display face that's fun and quirky because it has such a high X height. Um, and then if it's too low, that low X height might work great for headlines because you're going to be able to save space and you don't have to worry about legibility so much. So a lower X height works great in those settings, um, whereas a, uh, a medium X height might take up more space because your headlines are going to be further um, down. Right, real technical question that I'm sure Sorry. my mom and your mom are like, what? What, what is this kerning thing you're talking about? Um, now they think we are on drugs probably. So, <laughs> all right. Um, so you have a treehouse um, course, and I know we're, we have five minutes left. So, And it's really about typography the, for the web. So you started making all these things. They were really for blogs, so they were really web-based um, going to be used web-based. How did that influence and how did that, because really web-based font or web-based typography can be a lot different 
you have to think about things differently than you do if you were just doing it for print. So can you talk a little bit about why, um, how much you learned by doing this and then Treehouse contacted you? Yeah, so uh, Treehouse got in touch with me at Creative South, which was amazing. Amit, one of the dudes, he's a teacher at Treehouse. He was in the back of my course, and I was like, you look so familiar, but I know I've never met you. You know, but I had taken his courses on Treehouse before. So I, I was a Treehouse student back in the day, and that was where I learned how to do HTML. Like, I've learned it in the past, but that was where I got more of a solid foundation um, for that and CSS. And so I was building websites, and I thought I knew web typography, but I feel like it's totally different when someone asks you to teach it. Like, you really get, get into the ins and outs of, like, I totally didn't know that. Like, I mean, like, I thought I knew it, but, I, like, it's just... Being able to teach something is like writing it out and doing that is it was a great exercise and I think I learned and grew a lot as a designer for sure while doing that too. Um, but the web being so much different than print um, and it's it's not a static medium whereas a magazine that you're laying out and you get to get your you know your characters line exactly how you want it, you know, that's going to change as your screen size changes and then your sizes are going to feel too big when it shrinks down and certain things like that. So it's, I, I loved it. It was a lot of fun to do and it's more about, you know, laying out type for the web and what to do and how to choose typefaces for the web and all the good stuff. Kind of like the X-Height stuff that we were talking about there, those just principles to help you um, design for the web. So do you are you using a particular program and teaching like Glyph or are you just kind of talking in general people can use whatever program they're um, using? Right, so this one, as a job I do type design and then I'll do some typography and so this is all about typography about using typefaces and less about okay. building typefaces. And so the program we use is Sublime which is the, you know, editor, text editor that you can write code into and things like that. So it's pretty straightforward. I would love to teach a class um, on, you know, type design or type design for the web. Like, I think I still have a ton to learn on that sort of stuff too. So, um, yeah. Well, and things are always changing, so it's always kind of hard. So Jason Karn has a question, um, and I would like to know this too. So this is when I wrote it down. I was just hadn't gotten to it. I'm sorry. It wasn't in the typed questions. Um, so Jason wants to know, do you spend any time sketching out your type, or do you just jump directly into creating digitally? That's a great question, Jason. Um, I, in the past, and still, have only done digital. I, I, and I felt, like, a little lame because of that. Like, I like sketching and stuff, but it just felt like I wasn't a real designer for some reason because I didn't sketch because a lot of type designers will sketch out these really amazing letters, and I'm just like, I wish I could do that. Um... But then I, I read uh, an interview with Matthew Carter, who designed Georgia, Verdana, all these great typefaces, and he said he started, he, he does computer completely, you know, like, he's all digital, and so I was like, okay, I'm taking that and going with it. Like, I, I, I feel better about myself now. I think I'll, I'll definitely want to get into sketching, because um, uh, working with Kyle, Kyle Wayne Benson, he, he does... Like, it was really cool. He studied some sign painter stuff and just seeing him sketch that out and seeing the strokes of the pen and how it flowed. I think I have a lot to learn in that, and I would love to get into sketching, but right now I'm just starting out uh, purely on the computer or using a reference, like looking at old material and recreating it um, from that material um, that I found in an antique shop or in an old book or something like that. So, like, how you created Fort, it was a lot different because it wasn't kind of the blocky uh, slab serifs or sand serifs that you had kind of created. And that one seemed like it had more of a hand-drawn feel. Yeah. That one, and that one too, like, I, I, I guess going back to that stuff at the church and just just making do with what I have and trying to do that. So for Fort, it was like, I wrote up a, a, an article on the site, but just talking about how I developed it out. And I found typefaces whose letters I liked, but they all weren't jiving together, you know? And so creating something that did jive, and I did sketch that out and do it, but then I really did need to, like, I contacted my friend Kyle when I felt like I hit, I hit my end point because he knows more of that brush lettering style, and he came in and was like, oh, so your, your end points here, they're, you're a, a true you know, brush isn't going to be able to make that sharp of a curve or make that sharp of a point. You're going to want to more finish it off like this. So he was super helpful in that. And, I mean, I, I, like, I have a, a ton to learn in that. But, yeah, that was more of a sketch. 
All right, so one last question and then I'll let you go. And thank you so much. I know we've gone a little over. So um, you are working for yourself as a full-time um, designer, type designer, type font creator. Um, how do you feel about fonts being, I think, one of the most pirated software? Um, how do you kind of handle that hurdle? Yeah. Um... I mean, unfortunately, I was part of the problem back in the day as a high school kid, you know, or just like looking up fonts, and I didn't have a license to, and I would download them, and now I think I have much more of a appreciation for the work that goes into them, and I wouldn't want to do that, <laughs> and so I, uh, I feel like it was really disheartening for me to release a typeface like Industry Inc. and to see it next day on these forum sites and just being like, guys, come on. Like, and this is how I make a living. Like, it took a long, like, tons of months to make this, and now you can just down super quick without even paying for it. And so um, it, it was a little disheartening, but, I mean, and that sucks that it is, like, fonts being... They're so small, they're just a digital file, you know, but they can take so much time and work from someone's life. Uh, and just seeing that easily pirated is is definitely disheartening. But I think that for the most part, um, I've been really encouraged to see people buying fonts and be, like taking like supporting type design and, and supporting what it is. Because I think at first I didn't understand why they were so expensive um, way, 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 way back when. But now it's like, oh, I totally get it now. So Jason had another question, um, and your mom had a statement that I actually already asked him about, uh, Pam. So all right, so Jason says, um, do you think that do you think that affects the going straight digital affects the speed of the type construction at all? And he feels like creating digitally takes him longer um, than playing with things in a sketchbook. Oh yeah, I think that you can hammer out ideas a lot quicker. Personally, I'm tired Kyle. Kyle, thank you. <laughs> um, I think that I think that it can take a lot longer for sure, and that um, there are a few tools coming out digitally that seem to kind of try to help you formulate your idea of a typeface. Um, but for sure, Jason, like that, like I wish that I could sketch it out because I think with the sketch you're going to get more you have more grace because you're not going to pinpoint all the things that a computer will show up immediately with. And so, I, w I mean, if you're great at sketching, go for it, man. Like, I I'd be all for that. All right. So, and your mom says, keep up with all your good work. Um, and I think it's great that you inspired your mom to create a font. And she's still working on it. And, hey, it's better. You're further along than me, Pam, because I hadn't even gotten as far as you. So, I think that's awesome. I can't wait to see your mom's font whenever yeah, yeah. she gets it done. Well, I'm going to share with you um, Maddox's ways to connect with So you can um, follow him at Twitter and on Instagram at Fort Foundry. And there they are. And then also at FortFoundry.com, which I'm going to share again. And um, on Dribble at, and at, on Twitter, I have just the thing written twice. That's funny. It's I anyway. I'm just copying one of them. I don't know why. So at Dribble is at or at Maddox Schuler, and then also on Twitter at Maddox Schuler. So either one. So Maddox, thank you so much. You're uh, you have such a great attitude and um, it, you're so full of knowledge and super humble. And I really appreciate you sharing all that with us today. Thank you. I, I love being here and love talking about this stuff. If you all have more questions, feel free to email me too. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. I like talking about it, so thank you so much. It's it's cool when somebody actually understands what you're talking about when you're talking really deep in that kerning stuff. So um, yeah. <laughs> that that's it's really nice to be able to talk about that. But really, I'm going to attack it, and I will get back to you on how far I've come. So hopefully we'll, I'll be further along next time I see you hopefully I'll see you at Creative South yeah and just so you guys know I'm taking the week next week is off and then Bob Ewing is going to be on on the 19th or the 17th I can't remember whatever a Wednesday is and Bob's amazing and he does a lot of hand drawn type as well so um, Jason Carn, you better be here to see Bob do his stuff too um, so you guys will be amazed and I really like that Bob shares the good stuff and the bad stuff and he'll go in and analyze something and red market and I can't even tell where he's made the problem but he 
shows that even on Instagram. So I think that's really cool. And he's done a 365 project, which is longer than 365 days. So hopefully I'll see you all next. Um, not next week, but the week after. And I hope next you were awesome. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Yeah.